measuring the movement from magnitude 7.1 Ridgecrest quake in the Eastern California shear zone. And here they refer to it, sometimes called Walker Lane Fault Zone. And you'll see the uh, images of it. It's uh, a GIF. You'll see the movement of it. It looks like it's the Earth is breathing. Now, you'll notice that the mountain range as well has been lifted. Areas have been subsiding, others have been rising, and it's along the Walker Lane fault system. We see that in this case they have properly used the term Walker Lane fault system instead of the East California shear zone, which is part of the uh, bottom part of the Walker Lane fault system. And this is, you can see here, you'll notice that in the middle of the image you see the highway is cracked after the quake. You see the earth is as if it's breathing here. The whole area has been changed, uplifting and uh, deformation even along the mountains. I would venture to see the mountains have changed position. You can see the highway here near the crack and also towards the right side of the page, part of the highway there as well, where the crack runs from northeast to southwest. That is along the Walker Lane fault system. That's the area that goes all the way into the Cascadia Arc. The Walker Lane is locked with the Garlic Fault, which is locked in the west to San Andreas. And as we said before, the Walker Lane fault system, it's not one fault, it's a, it's a series of faults, takes up 25% of the pressure of the subduction of the Pacific Plate under the North American Plate, whereas the San Andreas Fault takes up the rest of the 75%. And they're all locked in together like an elongated oval. But the Walker Lane Fault System nudges up towards the Cascadia Arc. That's why the 6.2 magnitude quake of Canada on July 3rd, 13 hours later, give us, gave us the 6.4 July 4th Ridgecrest quake, which was a foreshock of the 7.1. And back in 2015, North Vancouver Island gave a magnitude 6.2 yet again, and that took 24 hours to get to Ridgecrest with a moderate size 3.5 magnitude earthquake. So we see that's not a coincidence, that happens. Because the whole thing is locked in like a zipper, like the teeth of a zipper, and it went and broke the pressure from Canada, from north of Vancouver Island in Bella Bella, Canada, all the way down to Ridgecrest, just like it did now. And, uh, okay, I'll just uh, throw that in here as well, that it was at the time, the day after, the total eclipse of the sun that came over this area all the way down through the Central uh, uh, Central America and uh, Latin America. So we know that the uh, USGS has confirmed that the movement of the moon, even in a total lunar eclipse, even monthly, has effects on water tides as well as earth tides. In other words, on the water, as well as tectonic plates. Now going to this, measuring the movements from the Ridgecrest quake, this is on Earth Observatory NASA. The ground beneath Southern California moved furiously early July. We're talking about July 4th in the morning, 2019, and then July 5th in the evening, due to two large earthquakes, one of which was the strongest in the region in at least two decades. Remote sensing scientists are getting better at measuring such events and showing how they disrupt and move the land surface. At 10.33 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, PDT, July 4th, 2019, that was a Thursday, an earthquake struck northeast of Ridgecrest, California, which is north of Los Angeles and northeast of Bakersfield. The magnitude 6.4 trembler turned out to be a foreshock of a stronger quake 
magnitude 7.1 that occurred 8.19 p.m. PTT, Friday, July 5th, about six miles to the northwest. In the days and weeks that followed, thousands of aftershocks rumbled beneath. Southern California, the vast majority of them too small to be felt by humans, though news outlets describe some damage to business and residential property. No major casualties or infrastructure breaks were reported. Now, okay, uh, we have to say here that both of those quakes were on different faults that they were cro that were crisscrossing each other. So one fault uh, ticked off the other fault. The 6.4 ticked off the other fault. And um, they were on the Walker Lane fault system, uh, which is locked to the Garlic Fault, which is locked to the west with San Andreas. And from what the USGS had said previously in one of my videos, I have to mention that, yes, this, these quakes did cause San Andreas to creep. So San Andreas did move because of these quakes. But they didn't mitigate what's being awaited to be given by San Andreas. Now, according to US Geological Survey, the Ridgecrest earthquakes release energy along at least two shallow strikes at faults about 100 miles northeast of San Andreas Fault, the quakes fell within the Eastern California shear zone, sometimes called Walker Lane. This is what we're talking about, that the geologists are not referring to this very often, because if we realize how big it is and what is involved, it's going to give, first of all, major quakes. Major meaning over 7.5, 8, 9 magnitude, okay? Now, in this area where the faults and their connections are less understood than the San Andreas, the maps on the page based on data from Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis, ARIA for short, team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, the California Institute of Technology Seismological Laboratory, as well as digital elevation models to show the contours of the land surface. The first map depicts the amount of ground displacement, land shifting vertically, horizontally or both, in meters. Blue areas moved roughly northwest, horizontally, and up vertically. Okay, we see that also in the interactive map. And while red and orange areas moved southeast and down. Okay, so you have that, the, the, the right part went down, the Ridgecrest part went up. So uh, the map shows the displacement visualized in three dimensions. The first earthquake, magnitude 6.4, involved motion on a fault aligned from northeast to southwest. This is visible on the map above as a difference in the colors between Ridgecrest and the area to the southeast. That quake probably triggered the larger magnitude, magnitude 7.1, earthquake with motion on a nearly perpendicular fault running northwest to southeast, the much stronger color discontinuity. You can see that there on these maps. ARIA researchers compiled and processed synthetic aperture radar, SAR for short, SAR data from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency ALOS-2 satellite. SAR instruments bounced radio signals off the ground and measured the reflections to determine the distance between the ground and the satellite. By comparing SAR images from different days, scientists can then determine how much the land surface and human-built structures have shifted. The ARIA team also used the data to create a map depicting areas that were likely damaged as a result of the earthquakes. These radar movement maps tell scientists where the faults moved and how much each part of the faults moved during the two quakes. This is what Eric Fielding said, He's a geophysicist and part of the ARIA group. He says geophysicists can then use computer models to estimate how stress has increased or decreased on other faults in the surrounding areas. Now, uh, you'll see from the interactive map here that uh, from northwest to southeast along that huge fault line on the Walker Lane fault system, we see it moving as if the whole thing is breathing. We even see the mountain range on the right being lifted somewhat, or, or sorry, uh, subsiding somewhat. The thing is, 
that that crack on the Walker Lane fault system uh, goes off the charts on the top and the bottom. So we assume that that crack movement kept on going. We don't know how long, how far north or south it kept on moving because it's off the chart here, it's off the image. And they don't tell us how far it went. Anyway, according to the area team, the land on the west of the fault in blue moved as much as two and a half feet. Red orange areas moved as much as two feet. According to USGS, the Pacific plate generally moves to the northwest relative to the North American plate. Okay, and uh, at approximately 48 millimeters per year. NASA provides such maps to the California Geological Survey, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and USGS as they assess damages and map the faults. The analysis can be used to estimate where the fault moves deep and which areas have increased stress and higher likelihood of future earthquakes. Quote, the SAR data were very useful for field mapping teams to help guide them where faults are located, end quote. Chris Milliner, geophysicist at JPL said, he adds, one interesting result is that the SAR revealed many more faults surrounding the main rupture than was anticipated. Of course, because as we said, Walker Lane fault system is made up of thousands of faults. He says, which might have been missed in the field without this remote guidance. Unfortunately, what this article didn't say is that the Ridgecrest earthquakes are in a volcanic field, the Kosovo volcanic field, and uh, is uh, the area of the Naval Air Warfare Center, China Lake, it's just north of Ridgecrest. And if you look at your Google Earth, you'll see that there's a lovely uh, cinder dome there, cinder, cinder dome from uh, that area, which is called uh, Volcano Peak Volcano. It's a cinder cone. And it's uh, very black and nice. It's got the lava flowing right south towards Ridgecrest. And uh, it looks as if it was uh, just overflowed yesterday, so clean. But we do have the recent listing of USGS that came out last fall, warning that there are certain dangerous volcanoes in the United States on the West Coast. Some of them are very high risk, others are not. The very high risk are Mount Shasta, Lassen Volcano Centers, and of course Long Valley Caldera, which is a supervolcano. Clear Lake is, fa is high, Clear Lake Volcanic Field, where we have the geysers. Clear Lake is part of the supervolcano of Long Valley Caldera. And uh, if you take the radius down south, from the same distance as you have from Long Valley to Clear Lake, take that radius down, the cost of volcanic field is even closer to Long Valley than Clear Lake is. So, Ubibi Craters, Mono Inyo area, Mount Whitney, Coso Volcanic Field. Ubibi craters in Coso Volcanic Field were classified as moderate threat for, by USGS last fall, and yet we have all this going on, so you can understand that there's no way they could know what volcanic fields are going to act, act as and when they're going to turn active, and it depends on uh, what happens with the magma. The magma, the magma chambers. Now we know that uh, Ridgecrest has a geothermal plant there. And it has a geothermal plant because it has a magma chamber underneath and it's one of the biggest geothermal plants in the country. Now, I noticed that we had an earthquake here today. I'll leave you a link for the Coso Volcanic Field Monitoring USGS. It's had, uh, this area has had over 80,000 quakes since the July 4th quake of 6.4, and they're still ongoing. Today we had a 3.6 magnitude quake in this area, and uh, that's not small, 3.6, and uh, it's about 9 kilometers depth, 
and uh, it's near. It's just uh, very close to. It's between the uh, naval uh, base, the naval air base, and Ridgecrest. So I'll leave you links below for you th for this. I'm happy that they did refer to the Walker Lane fault system here, even though they didn't mention that it was in a volcanic field. The USGS is monitoring for any type of deformation and volcanic eruption. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.